Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the Blue Green Alliance webinar, Game Changer, the Inflation Reduction Act and Clean Manufacturing. I am Abby Harvey, Deputy Communications Director here at the Blue Green Alliance, and alongside my colleague, Jasmine Mossberger, our Communications Manager, I will be helping to facilitate this discussion. Today, you will hear from experts from Minnesota to Ohio to DC to discuss how the Inflation Reduction Act is affording the United States a manufacturing renaissance that will not only reduce emissions in our industrial sector, but will also ensure a reliable supply of clean energy and provide more good jobs to hard hit communities. Our list of speakers includes Ben Beachy, the Vice President of Industrial Policy and Manufacturing here at the Blue Green Alliance, Jesse Jenkins, per Assistant, <laughs> Jesse Jenkins, Assistant Professor of Aerospace and Engineering at the Adlinger Center for Energy and Environment with Princeton University. Tishiana Payton, a member of the Communications Workers of America, Local 7304, and an employee at New Flyer in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Jackie Wong, Director of the Industry and Emerging Technologies Group at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And Eric Spiker, President of United Auto Workers Local 4104 at Cleveland Cliffs. Each of our panelists will speak for approximately 10 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. Questions can be submitted using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will be collecting questions throughout the program, so feel free to send those in um, as you think of them. Without further delay, please welcome Ben Beachy. Thank you, Abby. Um, welcome, everyone. Really glad you're here. Uh, so let me kick us off with some preliminary remarks. Uh, at the Blue Green Alliance, it is our belief that we should not have to choose between good jobs, a livable climate, and a fairer economy. The Inflation Reduction Act is the nation's most full-throated embrace to date of that essential truth. You know, addressing climate change requires us to build a clean economy, and that offers real opportunities to create good jobs for workers and invest in hard-hit communities. This win-win-win for climate, jobs, and justice is embedded in many of the Inflation Reduction Act's more than 100 climate and clean energy programs. Today, we're gonna to be zooming in on the law's investments in manufacturing. The law includes more than $50 billion in investments to revitalize manufacturing for the clean economy. That's an unprecedented sum. In addition to these supply side investments, the law includes measures to spark demand uh, for US clean energy manufacturing. Uh, for example, a domestic content bonus that was attached to the law's clean energy tax credits. We actually recently put out a guide to this domestic content bonus for clean energy developers. It's one of several recent publications we've put out on the Inflation Reduction Act and manufacturing that I'll be naming here. Uh, and my colleague Jasmine will be dropping in links to these resources as we go. We have already started to see the impacts of these landmark investments and incentives. Right now, the Inflation Reduction Act is enabling a game-changing expansion of U.S. manufacturing with factories breaking ground across the country to make the nuts and bolts of clean energy. In the first year of the Inflation Reduction Act, manufacturers announced 83 new or expanded utility-scale clean energy manufacturing facilities, according to American Clean Power Association. That includes 52 solar, 17 wind, and 14 battery manufacturing facilities. That is faster than anyone predicted. But why should we care? I mean, why does it matter if we're expanding domestic manufacturing of clean energy? Couldn't we just rely on imports? Let me offer a few reasons that this revitalization of manufacturing to build our clean energy future is critical for broadly shared goals. First, these manufacturing investments could help put a dent in income and racial inequality if we ensure equitable access to the new jobs and use strong labor standards to ensure that they are good union jobs. Both Tishiana and Eric will be speaking more on this later, offering uh, some firsthand expertise they've earned on the shop floor. Numerous studies find that the decline in US manufacturing in recent decades, due in part to unfair trade deals, has contributed to U.S. income inequality. The erosion of manufacturing meant workers lost a primary source of higher paying union jobs, communities lost tax revenue, and our nation lost the industrial base that is the backbone of modern economies. Less well known is that this decline in manufacturing also contributed to racial inequality, as Black workers have endured some of the biggest manufacturing job losses. 
Black manufacturing employment has fallen more than 30% since the late 1990s, according to the Economic Policy Institute. But now, if we use this wave of federal funding to grow clean manufacturing in a targeted way, it can help to reverse these trends by offering an on-ramp to the middle class for workers that have been excluded and investing in communities that have endured decades of divestment. We actually just published a map that shows this nation, the nationwide locations of several types of, of such hard hit communities. That includes environmental justice communities, coal communities, and deindustrialized communities. And this map is overlaid with all US manufacturing facilities that are producing clean energy components. That overlap between these hard hit communities and our clean manufacturing facilities reveals the opportunity to use these new federal investments in the Inflation Reduction Act to help reverse the history of chronic underinvestment that these communities have endured by investing in these communities to expand manufacturing of clean energy. But what about our climate goals? Why does domestic manufacturing of clean energy components matter for climate action? I'm gonna name five reasons. Number one, we need to build reliable clean energy supply chains. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us a lot about the dangers of relying on vulnerable overseas supply chains for critical goods. That is as true for clean energy as it was for N95 masks. We cannot expose our climate goals to shipping bottlenecks or geopolitical conflict. Ensuring access to clean energy means making more of the nuts and bolts here at home. To that end, we published this summer another resource, an analysis that identifies how many US facilities are currently making each com major component in the wind, solar, battery, grid, and other clean energy supply chains. This reveals the biggest supply chain gaps that we now have the opportunity to fill with Inflation Reduction Act investments. Such as the fact that we only have two facilities in the entire country that currently make electric steel for our electric grid. One of those facilities is where Eric and his union members work in Ohio. We need long-term price stability for clean energy. That's the second reason we it, it matters for climate action that we onshore clean energy manufacturing. Right now, 97% of the world's wafers for solar panels are made in China. Just like a corporate monopoly, when one country controls most of the supply of a critical clean energy good, they gain the power to increase the price of that good. We should not pin our climate goals on trust that the world's monopoly producers will maintain low prices. That's not what monopolies do. Instead, growth of clean energy manufacturing hubs in multiple countries, including the United States, helps to promote global competition and innovation, which are needed to continue driving down clean energy costs. And the Inflation Reduction Act has specific provisions to build U.S. solar and wind manufacturing hubs by making U.S.-made components cheaper than imports for the first time ever. That is one of the findings of a new study that Jesse Jenkins co-authored, which he'll be covering. The third reason that we need to onshore clean energy manufacturing for our climate goals is that we need climate action that counters worker exploitation. By boosting US clean technology manufacturing, these investments also will cut our dependency on clean energy products made overseas with labor abuses. I mean, the status quo is unjust and untenable. Right now, coerced workers in China make solar components. Children in the Congo mine cobalt for electric vehicle batteries. The clean energy economy cannot be built on the backs of exploited workers abroad. By onshoring clean energy manufacturing, we can help stop feeding these labor abuses and start to counter them. The other reason that we would want to onshore clean energy manufacturing is that it actually results in cleaner manufacturing, that is manufacturing with fewer emissions. Making clean energy components at home helps to reduce industrial emissions, which is one of the world's largest sources of climate pollution. Overseas corporations tend to be more emissions intensive than US factories in producing the aluminum, steel, and cement that goes into our solar panels, wind turbines, and other clean energy goods. 
A solar panel, for example, is about 85% aluminum. And producing the average ton of aluminum in China causes about 65% more climate pollution than in the United States. So onshoring the solar supply chain with help from the Inflation Reduction Act will help to reduce these emissions. Meanwhile, the law directly invests in further emissions reductions in U.S. factories, as Jackie from NRDC will be outlining later. To dig deep on the opportunity for aluminum, we published another report this summer that outlines how these investments could help expand U.S. aluminum manufacturing while making it even cleaner so as to secure an essential building block for clean energy. And the last reason that we need to uh, onshore clean energy manufacturing is that we need to expand public support for climate policies. Manufacturing jobs tend to offer above average wages, benefits, and union access. This expansion of manufacturing offers an opportunity for hard hit workers and communities to reap the economic gains of climate action. And that's not only good for economic security, it also will help to expand the chorus of workers and families who are calling for climate action. We will win more and more climate policies when more and more workers see climate action as essential, not only for future generations, but also for next month's paycheck. In short, as we build the growing clean energy economy, we face a clear choice. We could continue to hitch our climate goals to vulnerable overseas supply chains that are marred by labor abuses, higher levels of pollution, and shipping bottlenecks. Or we can build our clean energy future on a foundation of good jobs, clean manufacturing, and more reliable and equitable supply chains. The, invest the investments in the Inflation Reduction Act decisively put us on the latter path. In short, the law changes the game. It marks an overdue return to smart industrial policy by investing in industries that are strategically imperative, not only for climate action, but also a thriving and more just economy. That indeed is a win, win, win. A win for the workers now taking good union jobs, for the hard hit communities seeing investments for the first time in decades, and for all of us who seek a livable climate. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Jesse Jenkins. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate the opportunity to join everybody today. Um, and I want to speak to some of the results from a recent study um, commissioned by Blue Green Alliance that my colleague Aaron Mayfield at Dartmouth College and I um, put out uh, a couple months ago, looking at the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act on the cost of manufacturing wind and solar components in the U.S. versus importing those from abroad, and the overall impact on the cost of deploying clean energy here in the United States with implications for employment and materials demands like steel and aluminum. We, I think, often consider there to be a trade-off between the pace and affordability of decarbonization and how quickly we can and cheaply we can deploy clean resources and other priorities like building good paying jobs and a domestic economy around wind and solar manufacturing. The reality is that trade-off, I think, is overblown in many people's minds. It's larger than it really um, uh, is if we actually quantify the cost advantages that um, that imported products have. And in a prior study that we completed um, looking at the impacts before the Inflation Reduction Act, we concluded that it would be about 32% cheaper for solar developers to source a fully imported set of solar modules with 100% imported content than it would be to rely on 100% U.S. manufactured uh, solar supply chain. That's before considering any import tariffs that we've applied on Chinese products um, or subsidies that we might have now made available for U.S. manufacturers. So that is a significant um, uh, premium for, for domestic content today. But we should remember that modules represent on less than half and a declining share of the total cost of installing a utility scale solar and wind farm and an even more uh, insignificant share of installing a distributed solar farm on someone's or solar panels on someone's roof. And so the impact on the cost of a uh, utility scale solar farm of moving from our current average domestic market share to 100% domestic market share is only about a 10% increase in the cost of installing a, a solar PV, a solar PV farm. Where there's really no appreciable cost premium for producing wind components here in the United States, given the size of those components, shipping them from abroad is actually quite expensive. And US manufacturing is quite competitive in these areas. The challenge has been the on-again, off-again nature of US policy support. 
We've seen the production tax credit for wind expire and be renewed or be renewed at the very last minute uh, multiple times throughout that history. And that's created an extreme volatility that's made it very difficult for U.S. manufacturers to invest here in the U.S. Now, thanks to the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, all of that has changed. The 45X Advanced Manufacturing Production Tax Credit provided by the Inflation Reduction Act provides direct manufacturing subsidies for the first time for the production of solar panel components all up and down the supply chain, wind turbines, nacelles, blades, and other supporting equipment, um, and support for advanced battery or for battery manufacturing and uh, critical minerals production in the U.S. as well. And we find that thanks to those incentives, it will now be 30% cheaper to source a module from 100% American supply chain than it would be to import the same goods. So the tables have turned. It's now in the economic advantage of a developer to source panels made in the USA if they can find them. And again, that's before any tariffs have been applied to imported products and without considering an additional 10% bonus um, domestic content bonus that increases the value of the production tax credit for wind or solar developers if they can buy American. Since wind components were already uh, cost competitive without 45X, again, it will now be cheaper to produce or to, for, for wind developers to procure uh, solar or wind turbines built here in the United States. So we've now created an economic advantage for those who buy American. The trade-off between buying in the uh, products made in the United States and uh, affordably decarbonizing our grid has been removed by the Inflation Reduction Act. We've also created a long-term stable investment environment that can give confidence to manufacturers to expand supply chains here in the US. The production tax credit and investment tax credit that spur the deployment of wind and solar resources, again, have expired numerous times in their history. Now they're extended at full value until we hit a 75% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from 2022 levels. That's not likely to happen until the mid 2030s. And that's for the commence construction date for projects. Um, so the year after we hit that target, projects that commence construction during that year will still have access to the full production tax credit or investment tax credit, even if it takes them another two, three or four years to complete. What that means is that basically from now through the through projects coming online through the end of the 2030s, they have full uh, clarity as to the policy environment that they face and the degree of federal policy support um, uh, and, and tailwinds behind them. And that makes investing in the U.S. much safer, in U.S. manufacturing, uh, much safer for manufacturers. So considering the competitive cost of domestic components after accounting for 45x, as well as the 10% credit for uh, domestic content to, for the PTC and ITC. Um, the IRA is gonna create a significant demand for solar components and wind components manufactured in the US. Again, project developers will be more competitive than their competitors if they can source products in the US. And that demand is likely to quickly outstrip current US solar and wind component manufacturing capacity. That's gonna prompt significant investments to expand, expand US supply chains. And indeed, we're already seeing that happen and announced in real investments to date. In our study, we estimate that the Inflation Reduction Act could induce demand for about 1.3 million additional jobs related to utility scale solar and 250,000 wind related jobs by 2035 relative to the level of employment in those sectors if we had not passed the Inflation Reduction Act. This includes domestic demand for an additional 800,000 jobs in solar manufacturing and about 55,000 additional jobs in wind manufacturing by 2035. IRIS policies to onshore the wind and solar supply chains are critical to that overall job creation. We found that domestic demand for solar and wind manufacturing employment in 2035 would be about 800,000 jobs lower if solar and wind development expanded due to IRIS support, so we deploy more wind and solar, but domestic content shares remained at their current level. So we made no progress in onshoring those industries. So 800,000 additional jobs, thanks to the efforts to onshore solar and wind manufacturing supply chains. And under the IRA, the IRA, aluminum, cement, and steel demand for construction of solar and wind components, we estimate would increase by about an order of magnitude between 2023 and 2035. That's gonna create more opportunity for US job creation and employment in the materials supply sectors, including aluminum and steel workers. And while we didn't directly assess lithium ion battery manufacturing costs in our study, the IRA lowers the cost of US manufacturing of uh, an assembly of battery cells and, and packs by about 35%, which I'm very confident makes it cheaper to manufacture batteries in the USA than to import them from abroad. 
And the proof is in the massive number of new battery manufacturing plants announced across the US, with more than $26 billion in actual investment already made in US battery plants since the IRA, IRA, since the IRA passed, and tens of billions more announced projects along the way. So some may ask if the US can really compete in these sectors, or are we just creating a dependence on subsidies and these industries will struggle if we remove those subsidies in the future? I think it's important to step back and remember that China doesn't control these sectors today, whether it's wind or solar or batteries, because they have some inherent advantage in labor costs or material resources. These are highly automated and advanced manufacturing sectors. So labor cost is not a huge factor in China's advantage. And China is not a major producer of most of the materials going into solar panels, wind farms, or batteries. They don't mine and produce these components other than graphite domestically. What they do is import them from abroad and process these materials in China into refined products and assemble them into manufactured value-added components. So China leads not because of labor or materials advantages, but because they decided a decade ago to establish robust industrial policy to dominate and lead the world in these industries. China decided around 2010 to lead the world in solar, wind, batteries, and EVs, and they implemented a range of policies to ensure their industries would lead and grow. Those include subsidized loans, free lands for industrial clusters, domestic content requirements and subsidies to build domestic demand and um, stand up those industries, and more. Meanwhile, the U.S. sat on the sidelines and just didn't compete. And sure enough, we've been left behind. But now we're back in the game. The U.S. has a robust industrial strategy and strong policy support to compete in the manufacturing and production of these important and growing industries for the first time. So the game is now on, and I, for one, think that U.S. industries and workers can compete and they can win. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. Um, much appreciated. Next up, we have Tishiona Peyton. Hello. Um, excuse me, I am new at this, so I've never had to do any of these type of speaking things before. Um, my name is Tishiana Payton. I work for a new flyer in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and we make um, electric and hybrid city buses for all over the United States. Um, the job itself is a job like any other. We uh, go to work Monday through Friday with the basic overtime to uh, make sure we can provide for our families and with the IRA like we uh, most people like me like I'm a single parent of two kids I don't have any other extra support my job means a lot to me and with the IRA we uh, we've been able to get higher wages with uh, the help of our union fighting for better wages and better benefits for us to make sure that we are able to make it and maintain our bills and take care of our families. Um, New Flyer itself has been receiving many orders for hybrid buses and electric buses, which means more job opening for our community, um, especially for people that are willing to work that may be a lower income and need the work. New Flyer offers all types of jobs for many different people so that you know they can provide for for their families as well with the demand of the electric buses our union itself helps us to make sure we're prepared for them and skilled and trained properly so that we can make efficient buses and that they run well and they are up to standard um with making electric buses and the with the Clean Energy Act, us making 15 buses will replace 625 cars. So the energy-wise is the, the not the energy, the Clean Energy Act is, you know, that's all in effect. Um, I really don't know much more. Um, we... Uh, We recently uh, had a visit at our plant by the vice president earlier this year, and she was all for our electric buses and how they were all for the Clean Energy Act. 
And I was one of the people that got to meet her and take her on a tour through our facility on what we do at our company and how everything works in our building itself. Um, the the IRA, I think it needs it needs all the funding that it can get for people of low income, people of color like me that may not have accessibility to resources and whatnot. We we have jobs like New Flyer and other companies that pay a good wages that we we can maintain a living. Thank you, Tishiana. Much thank you so much for for being with us today. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic now to to Jackie Wong. Great, thank you so much, Ben and Tishiana. Um, I'd like to speak today about how the Inflation Reduction Act will both boost domestic clean energy manufacturing and help to decarbonize heavy industry. But first, I'd like to provide a little context. Um, at its peak in 1979, the U.S. manufacturing sector accounted for almost 20 million jobs. But as the population of our country nearly grew 50% over the subsequent 40 years, U.S. manufacturing jobs actually fell by 35%. And it's not just that we got a whole lot more efficient at producing the same quantities with less manpower. Instead, we produce less while the rest of the world produced more and our market share fell accordingly. So for example, America's steel mills made more than half of the world's steel in the late 1940s and about 40% through the 1950s. And today it's more like 4%. It's no secret that the large scale loss of jobs associated with this decline has devastated communities across the country as well as led to growing economic inequality. But on top of that, and to reiterate what Ben mentioned up front, the shift in manufacturing overseas has had three major downsides. First is we've left ourselves vulnerable to supply chain instability and insecurity. Number two is we have ceded production to countries that are notorious for labor and human rights violations. And number three, we've seen materials that could be made cleaner here, instead be manufactured elsewhere with worse climate and environmental outcomes. And I'd like to focus on the last of the three. In a lot of cases, the emissions intensity of industrial materials produced in the US is meaningfully lower than when those same materials are produced elsewhere. So for example, BGA's Aluminum Revitalized report, uh, whose link is in the chat, noted that China's aluminum production is about 65% more emissions intensive than ours, whereas India's aluminum production is about twice as emissions intensive as ours. But thanks to several important provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act, I think that we have a really good opportunity to reshore manufacturing for basic industrial materials, as well as ramp up manufacturing for clean energy technologies in a way that expands affordable access to clean energy while supporting good union jobs and investments in hard hit communities. So, there are two particular provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that I want to highlight that will help to ramp up domestic clean energy manufacturing. The first is the Section 45X Advanced Manufacturing Production Tax Credit. Um, Jesse already spoke about how 45X will completely change the math when it comes to domestically manufacturing clean energy components instead of importing them, so I will not dwell on the point. But in addition to 45X, the Inflation Reduction Act also included $10 billion for the Section 48C Advanced Energy Project Tax Credit, which provides an investment tax credit of up to 30% for projects that expand domestic clean energy manufacturing. And notably, 48C sets aside 40% of that 10 billion for projects in coal communities. And in addition, Projects can only qualify for the full 30% tax credit if they meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. 48C was first created under the Recovery Act stimulus package in 2009, from which a little more than $2 billion in tax credits were allocated to almost 200 clean energy manufacturing projects across 43 states and estimated to support 58,000 jobs. At the time, they were only able to fund less than one third of the eligible projects that applied. So this time around, and with $10 billion in new funding, 
It's been estimated that the expanded 48C program could support 110,000 jobs over the next 10 years. A few months ago, BGA released a really interesting analysis in which it looked at the specific segments of the clean energy supply chains where we face the biggest gaps in terms of domestic manufacturing capacity. Ben mentioned this earlier. Um, in this analysis, BGA assigned a score to each component in various critical supply chains to indicate the extent to which we have or lack domestic manufacturing capacity. The analysis is well worth a look, and I'd like to lift up their recommendation that the administration prioritize 48C funding for the components in the supply chains where we have zero, limited, or moderate domestic production capacity. Meeting our climate goals requires domestic, reliable domestic supply chains so that we have steady access to the nuts and bolts of clean energy. Another eligible use of the 48C tax credit is investment, um, investments by industrial or manufacturing facilities in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This is really important. As we expand domestic production to meet the demands of a growing clean energy economy, we also want to make sure that the aluminum that goes into solar panels and the cemented steel that go into wind turbines are among the cleanest in the world. The Inflation Reduction Act provides almost $6 billion to do just that. So more specifically, the Industrial Demonstrations Program will provide grants to help deploy next generation technologies to deeply decarbonize heavy industry. The Department of Energy is administering this program and is expected to announce its funding selections this winter. And I'm hopeful that this could really be a game changer in terms of getting truly transformative technologies off the ground. So, you know, you can see that there's a lot in the Inflation Reduction Act to be excited about when it comes to the potential to revitalize the US manufacturing sector and to clean up heavy industry. But with that said, we are far from being able to declare victory. These investments are giving us a much needed and hugely consequential jump start, but they are only the start. We are going to need to complement them with further policies to spur along this transformation of our manufacturing sector and to create demand for low carbon industrial materials and clean energy technologies that are made right here at home by our skilled workforce. So in conclusion, you know, many years from now, when we look back on today, I really think and hope that we will view this as a turning point in which Inflation Reduction Act investments help the US to set an example for the rest of the world that we can achieve the win 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 that Ben mentioned up front. That we can do what's right for the climate and the health of our communities, while also turbocharging our economy and creating millions of family sustaining jobs for our manufacturing workers. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks for your expertise. Um, Eric, we're going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Eric Spiker. I am the current president of UAW Local 4104 at Cleveland Cliffs in Zanesville, Ohio. Uh, as Ben said earlier, we're one of the only two manufacturing facilities that produce electrical steel. Uh, it's a critical component to, for our electric grid. Uh, the products that we do finish are uh, grain-oriented electrical steel, referred to as GOES, for power distribution transformers, uh, and the non-grain-oriented -or electrical steel, referred to as NOES, uh, which are used in the electric motors and generators. Uh, with the recent uh, $30 million investment that Cliffs uh, invested in our Zanesville plant, we'll be capable of producing more nose that will be used in the electric vehicles. Our plant, uh, it has been around for over 100 years and it's always kind of been the premier place to work in our area. There are our second and third generation members right now uh, in our workforce. And since uh, Cleveland Cliffs has taken us over, our union membership has more than doubled. And hopefully with the more investments to come, we will, hopefully we can double that again. Uh, our membership has always taken pride in their, in their jobs and the quality of product that we put out and the impact that we have on the environment. Uh, you know, without continued investment in American manufacturing, I don't feel that, that our growth of our membership would have been possible. Uh, 
by keeping your manufacturing in the United States, we're, we're going to secure our supply chain for the future of our next generation. Uh, and without these investments in the manufacturing, whether it be from the, the IRA or the uh, companies themselves, uh, we're going to put the fate of our nation in the hands of the others. Uh, that's why we need to keep our manufacturing in the U.S. and not rely on products that are manufactured elsewhere in the world. Uh, these jobs uh, in manufacturing are good paying union jobs uh, that provide a good living wage, good benefits, and uh, also care about the environment and the communities they surround. Uh, the investments all uh, big opportunities to ensure that we have a domestic stable domestic supply chain. Uh, and with the, the investments in the manufacturing facilities, it also supports a lot of other local businesses around it as well. And uh, it, any closure of any manufacturing facilities, devastating not only to the membership that works there, but the areas and the communities that surround it and our country as well. Uh, it's always been a place where I plan to retire from and would like to see many more generations to come retire from as well. Uh, and with the continued investments in manufacturing, which include the investments in a workforce, uh, that could be possible. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Appreciate uh, you coming along to share with us, Eric. Um, and thank you to to everyone, to to Jesse, to Tishiana, to Jackie, to Eric. Uh, again, uh, each experts on on the intersection of climate and labor, as you've heard today. Uh, let us move to some Q and A. Uh, we've got three questions so far in the in the chat. Um, I'll I'll just uh, again invite anyone if you'd like to submit a question. You can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. It's a Q and A function. Uh, all of us will be able to see your question once you once you've submitted it. Um, so we'll take a couple of these here. Um, one is a question. The first one is uh, about the specific provisions attached to two of the bigger chunks of money in the Inflation Reduction Act for clean energy manufacturing that both Jesse and Jackie spoke to, which are 45X and 48C. And if you don't speak wonk, what that means is 45X is a production tax credit so that companies that are manufacturing components for the wind, solar, or battery supply chains, uh, that their production costs go down. Um, and as Jesse named, that is that uh, provision alone is what makes U.S. manufacturing of components for uh, wind and solar cheaper than imports for the first time in U.S. history. Uh, the second thing that's named here is 48C. Um, 48C, if you don't speak wonk, is a $10 billion, uh, 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 but it's an existing program that got an additional $10 billion through the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to help uh, manufacturers expand uh, clean tech manufacturing facilities. $4 billion of that $10 billion is set aside explicitly for coal communities. Um, and so the question uh, that this person is asking, this is coming from Judith Barish, is whether or not uh, there are uh, any uh, labor requirements um, in, in, attached to these. And I think Judith is, is correctly noting that for operations jobs, that is for manufacturing jobs, uh, does not see uh, ex explicit labor requirements in the statute, in, in the actual law. Um, and so the question is, how can we ensure you know, that the jobs created um, from, these, uh, from, from these tax credits, from these investments, will actually be good union jobs, as everyone on the screen has, has spoken to today? I, I can take a, a, a first stab at that, and then I would invite all of my uh, co-panelists to, to, to pile on as you would like. Um, so I would say, first off, it is, it is true. We did not get everything that we fought for in, in this bill. And by we, I mean the big collective we. Many, many uh, people across unions, uh, climate groups, environmental justice groups, and, and, and well beyond. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, we fought for were, uh, so, was some more explicit language uh, prioritizing unions and labor standards at several junctures in the bill. That said, if you actually look at uh, the rules that are being crafted uh, for these uh, uh, major multi-billion dollar programs, the rules that are being crafted by the Biden administration right now are decidedly pro-union, pro-labor, uh, pro-environmental justice, uh, pro-equity. 
And I can give you some examples uh, for the specific, one of the specific buckets that you named, the 48C program. So a, a lot of the, uh, so these are like multi-billion dollar programs that are getting stood up in this law with only like a couple of pages of text, right? So that leaves a lot of the details to be spelled out by the Biden administration, namely in this case, the Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy has started spelling out some details uh, for that 48C program. This is the $10 billion program to expand clean energy manufacturing. Uh, right now, actually, they're considering applications uh, that have been put forward for that very program. Uh, let me name some of the criteria, I actually have them written down in front of me, that the Department of Energy has said they will be using to determine which projects actually get funding and which ones do not. One of those criteria is, quote, whether workers can form and join unions of their choosing. So you as a business are more likely to get 48C investments if workers can form and join unions of their, of their choosing. Uh, if there are apprenticeship readiness programs serving displaced industrial workers. So if there are, we talked about on ramps uh, to good family sustaining careers, uh, if you actually have apprenticeship programs which provide those on ramps, uh, you're more likely to get the funding. Uh, you're more likely to get the funding if you negotiate legal agreements with workers, including unions and community groups that deliver specific benefits, such as community benefits agreements, uh, collective bargaining agreements, or project labor agreements. Uh, and then to build on some of the things that Jackie was mentioning, they're also concerned not only with uh, how much, how many clean energy widgets you'll be producing, but what is the, quote, impact of your project on local air, water, and or land quality? Um, what are the what benefits will be accruing to Justice 40 communities? What opportunities are you creating to transition for transition for workers in coal or other uh, fossil fuel industries? The list goes on, right? In some, this is a, a raft of high road labor and equity standards that the Biden administration is attaching uh, to to this funding. And what that means is we actually do have a real opportunity to translate these landmark investments into equitable access to good union jobs and locally defined health and economic benefits for hard hit communities. But it's gonna require a lot of work, right? It's requiring a lot of work from the Biden administration. I think it's gonna require a lot of work from all of us on the outside um, to, to ensure that those high road labor and equity standards uh, translate into meaningful change on the ground. I would stop there and invite any of my co-panelists to get in on this question that who want to. I think that was pretty thorough. <laughs> Sorry for the for the thorough response. I've I've gotten this question a few times at this stage. No, that's great. <laughs> All right, we've got another question here. Um, we have uh, a question uh, about uh, rare earth mining and lithium mines, uh, and the extent to which the IRA will will focus uh, on, on such uh, materials uh, that are needed for the clean energy economy. Uh, Jesse, I'm curious if, if you want to take a stab at that. Yeah. So when it comes to those raw materials, there actually are a range of policies in both the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act that are going to help encourage development of um, both raw mineral production and um, processing uh, in the United States or refining of those minerals into to more refined ores or, or um, precursors for, for you know, use in battery anodes or electrodes. Um, so the 45X credit that we've talked about several times, this advanced manufacturing production tax credit, includes a 10% um, production tax credit for a whole range of critical minerals. It's a good chunk of the periodic table listed in the law, um, which includes you know all the things that you would be using in solar, wind, um, you know uh, permanent magnet rotors, uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, batteries and, and motor assemblies, all of that. Um, are supported in in the law with a 10% um, production tax credit. So whatever the cost of producing them are, 10% uh, of that value is claimable as a tax credit. And again, that will provide a, a significant incentive for production in the US. There's also a, a major focus on expanding battery recycling capabilities in the US. Um, so there's a, I think, I can't remember exactly how many billions of dollars in, in grant funding in the infrastructure law, as well as loan guarantee programs um, that can support uh, battery um, recycling facilities. 
Um, so remember that one of the advantages of using minerals instead of burning fossil fuels is that once you burn the fuels, they end up in our lungs and in the atmosphere, but not something we can use again. Um, whereas when we use minerals in a battery, um, when that battery is at the end of its life, we can disassemble it and recycle a, a high proportion of the content of those batteries, just like we recycle scrap steel now for a huge portion of our uh, total primary st or total steel needs. Um, so there's a lot of, in the in the both laws to help ensure we can expand our domestic supply chains. Um, there's also a sourcing requirement attached to the uh, consumer electric vehicle tax credit or personal EV tax credit that tries to ensure that the battery um, assembly and the critical minerals production occurs not necessarily in the United States, but in North America or in allied countries in the case of the minerals. So countries with free trade agreements with the United States. Um, and that gives us at least some leverage over the environmental and labor standards that go along with those agreements and the production of those minerals um, abroad. Um, so definitely something that was on legislators' minds and, and something that made uh, we made some significant progress on. Again, not not everything you might have wanted, not everything not perfect, but um, but an effort to expand those supply chains. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, the next question comes from Sandy Doyle, um, and it's for Eric and Tiziana. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, sorry, just disappeared. Uh, how do you feel about being part of the clean energy economy? Um, you know, does this, is this something that you talk about in your communities? Uh, being part of the clean clean energy, or the, you know, being part of it all is 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 a great thing. I mean, that's the way we're going, the direction that the country needs to go to to uh, to make the environment better for everybody. Thank you. Um, you yes, yeah, so not only does you know it makes the economy better for everyone. It we we take pride in making these buses. You know, we see these buses in our own cities on any TV shows or movies out of LA or New York. And we take pride in knowing that we we are the ones building these buses for the clean economy. And, you know, we even my kids, like my daughter will ask me, mom, do you make that bus? Like, yeah, yeah I made one of those buses before. Maybe not that one, but I've made them before. That's pretty awesome. Thanks, Tishiana. Nothing I have produced has ever showed up on TV. Uh, so kudos. Um, all right. Uh, we've got another question uh, for, for Jesse. Um, and this one comes from uh, Bianca Flowers, um, you know, asking about the, the uh, to what extent are these tax subsidies uh, that are given to OEMs uh, public? Um, have you and your team been able to dig into data uh, to quantify uh, how much uh, manufacturers are getting, for example, uh, to uh, uh, run a solar turbine enterprise. Yeah, I don't think that the data is public. I mean, it's it's part of tax filings, and so it's treated as confidential. But a lot of it's it's possible to estimate the volumes of these things from information that is public. You know, a lot of these are tied to specifically to uh, manufactured quantities. So you know, how many watts of solar panels or how many kilograms of silicon, uh, polysilicon are produced, uh, how many EV, you know, kilowatt hours of EV batteries are produced. And so it, it will be possible over time to, to take public information on the quantities produced by different facilities and probably estimate pretty accurately the level of, of subsidy that's been provided to different, uh, different OEMs or different manufacturers. Um, I haven't done that uh, to date. Um, we're just starting to see these programs uh, enacted and, and no one's yet claimed the tax credits. Um, until the next, you know, until next April when people file their taxes for for this tax year, um, and in some of the cases, like 45X, we're still waiting on the final Treasury guidance on exactly how the rules are going to work, um, and so uh, it's something that we'll have to keep a close eye on over time. Um, and I see, you know, another question about how union workers can, you know, can can leverage this maybe to fight in, in their fights for wage increases. I mean, I think it's it's an important component of ongoing labor disputes and and the the effort to make a strong case to the public and to to management that workers deserve their share of the you know profitability that comes with these kinds of uh incentives and the the profits that the companies are going to be making i've seen how effective the arguments have been about the profitability of uh the auto work auto uh, makers over the last few years and how auto workers demand you know deserve a share of that well this is going to be part of that story going forward is the role of these these public incentives and and i think it you know while it doesn't directly ensure that um 
that you know that the those jobs will be unionized it does provide stronger incentives for for labor to to make a strong case thank you jesse um now we have one on 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 by american uh the question is you know what opportunities are there for good paying union jobs under buy america build america requirements for federally funded infrastructure projects um, and and I'm happy to take a, a first stab at this, but have, anyone else is, of course, welcome to join in. Uh, so I would say the, the the Buy America, Build America requirements are uh, you, you know directly applied uh, by the Biden administration to a lot of the bipartisan infrastructure law funding. So a, a kind of a companion law to the law that we've been talking about today, which is the Inflation Reduction Act with, with historic investments in climate and clean energy. The, the bipartisan infrastructure law, as as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, is a is a another historic investment to upgrade our our roads and bridges, upgrade our public transit, um, and a host of other uh, public infrastructure to enable a fairer economy. Uh, and the Biden administration uh, made abundantly clear that Buy America, Build America will apply to those infrastructure investments for public infrastructure. Um, and, and what that effectively means is that. Um, you know, the, the, the companies that get the contracts uh, to build that bridge with, with a lot of steel and, and cement and aluminum uh, need to be uh, purchasing uh, from, from U.S. Uh, manufacturers of steel, uh, uh, aluminum, cement, and, and certain manufactured products. Um, and what that really means in essence is it, it, is a, it is a good opportunity to ensure that our tax dollars continue to be re recycled in the U.S. economy, supporting more and more uh, good jobs. Um, and uh, another benefit, uh, which is uh, indirect but important, is that uh, if you're buying more U.S. made steel, you are going to be buying some of the cleanest steel in the world. To the point that Jackie just made earlier, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, the U.S. is the cleanest of all major steel uh, producers in the world, on average. Uh, uh, and I mentioned before some of the stats on aluminum. We, uh, China, now makes a majority of the world's aluminum. The U.S. used to be uh, uh, the world's largest uh, uh, aluminum manufacturer, and and after uh, decades of decline due to unfair trade deals and otherwise. Um, today, uh, a majority of the aluminum uh, comes from China, and that is a climate issue because the average ton of aluminum produced in China is 65% more emissions intensive than the average ton in the United States. So these Buy America, Build America uh, provisions are certainly good for jobs. Um, they are also uh, good for climate action in that they are requiring companies that are getting taxpayer dollars to, to upgrade our bridges and, uh, and other infrastructure uh, to use uh, some of the uh, cleanest materials in the world. That concludes the open list of questions. I'll spend one more second. Any last call, any last questions? Uh, you've got a panel of experts in front of you, so don't be shy. All right, very healthy conversation, robust. Thank you again uh, for to Eric, to Tishiana, to Jackie, to Jesse for lending your time and expertise today. Um, on behalf of Blue Green Alliance, thank you to everyone who joined uh, for jumping in. Just to reiterate, uh, this truly is an inflection point uh, as we face a historic wave of investments uh, to build cleaner, uh, fairer, more reliable uh, supply chains uh, for our clean energy future um, while supporting good union jobs uh, and a more just economy. And with that, I think I'm going to close this out and uh, say I hope you all have a happy Thursday. <laughs>